All right, welcome to Dow Talk. We're super excited to have Daniel Goldman and Matt Pering from Arbitrum on. We're going to be discussing all things Arbitrum Dow. How does it work? What are we excited about? And what can we look forward to going forward? So Daniel, Matt, welcome. We're just going to get started with some quick background intro on both of you. So Daniel, I'll ask you to start. Um, just tell us a little bit more about how you got into working in crypto Web3 and ultimately ended up at Arbitrum. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, I have uh, I came from a background as a software engineer um, and kind of was like following Bitcoin, I think, since 2011 and was fascinated, but didn't didn't really do anything about it, uh, unfortunately, um, until um, about 2017. My friend kind of told me about Ethereum and we started a, like a small tech consulting outfit, basically. Um, that was kind of when I became more obsessed and fell down the rabbit hole, particularly about layer two scaling. Um, uh, was very interesting to me. Uh, I wrote some things that got some attention. It's kind of when I got addicted to crypto Twitter. Uh, it was kind of all, all downhill from there, I guess. Um, eventually, I ended up, um, I guess, on the topic of DAOs. Uh, um, I was sort of summoned by Moloch DAO to write a piece on, on optimistic rollups. Um, and that was actually how I met uh, the Off Chain Labs founders. Um, and, uh, yeah, I was just, uh, you know, we kind of hit it off. I was blown away by what they were showing me and joined, joined around then the beginning of 2020 and the rest was, uh, the rest was history. That's very cool. Yeah. You, uh, you can, you should follow Daniel on Twitter. We'll have his, his handle in the show notes. Um, I, 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 I followed you on Twitter long before, like we were working with Arbitrum in, in, in any capacity. Great Twitter follow. Um, all right, Matt, um, over to you. So tell 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 us a little bit about how you got into working in crypto and ended up at Arbitrum. Sure. Um, yeah. So my story is a lot less like native and fun uh, than Daniel's, but I think like most people, right? Um, maybe not most people, but when I you know was younger, I heard about kind of Bitcoin, heard about Ethereum, was fascinated with kind of like the idea that we could take the internet as we know it and kind of iterate on it um, purely for financial sakes. It's just empower more people. So I was emboldened by that narrative, but not really doing anything related to computer science in a personal capacity day to day. Um, did a few things, went to business school, um, worked in web two for a few years, kind of from consumer products, um, all the way to developer platforms and tooling. And I, you know, got really interested in machine learning. I got really interested in kind of like low level, um, upgrades to programming languages. And that's when I kind of was at this intersection of the work I was doing, talking to a lot of developers and then seeing that go, which is, the Golang team is uh, the team that I was last on and how much of that was being used in crypto. And, and, and that's kind of, uh, I guess I'll say when I realized that there were real people doing real things in the industry. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, yeah, then, then I, you know, so very late, I think this is, you know, 2018, 2019, when I started thinking about this stuff, um, started following layer two, um, started realizing that there was information I could consume, um, looked at a bunch of teams, saw off chain labs, was building something that was real and, actually in production and is i would say still the team that doesn't advertise things that aren't ready um in any capacity like there's some things are still in testing but there's a difference um so i had a lot of respect and that's how i ended up here um got very lucky but yeah that's that's my journey <laughs> very cool i guess i should say you guys work for off-chain labs right as opposed to arbitrum or is it either or I think that's right. We, should, we it, probably should have corrected yeah. you, but we're getting we're getting used to it. Yeah. So, so yeah, we we, we yeah, we it for makes us. sense because now Arbitrum is is probably more so the DAO, right? And then Offchain Labs is a service provider to the DAO. Cool. Very much. Cool. Yeah. I'll try to I'll try to stick to Offchain Labs. <laughs> you guys have so many like names, you know. It's all good stuff like Offchain Labs, Orbit, Nitro, Nova. It's hard to keep right. track of all of them. <laughs> yeah, we've got a great glossary on the docs that I recommend. Yeah. Um, we try to keep that up cool. to date. Yeah, but yeah, it's a lot of words. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, yeah, I think what we primarily want to focus on today is the Arbitrum DAO. Um, so obviously, like at Tally, we're we're very very excited to see another DAO launch. Um, we've we've long sort of uh, had the philosophy that layer twos would end up having on chain governance and AB mm -hmm. DAOs because it's sort of like the the most secure or the least not secure way <laughs> to sort of um, manage uh, upgrades on a roll-up. And um, we were really excited to connect 
um, with y'all and see your pl- that your plans really lined up with like kind of how, how we had been thinking about things on our side. So we're we're incredibly excited to see um, to see the Arbitrum DAO launch and also um, just really impressed with how y'all have executed it, both on the technical side and around just like the overall plan, comms, like um, just just everything, right? The the social side and and the the technical side. So um, just really want to dive into the Arbitrum DAO and how it works. Um, you know, don't feel like you need to dumb it down. Like this is a very, very nerdy DAO podcast. Like <laughs> we have like sort of this like very niche, but real audience of people who just are obsessed with DAO. So, nice. you know, uh, feel free to go all the way down the rabbit hole. Um, and yeah. yeah, maybe I'll start with Matt and then go to Daniel. Um, so Matt, maybe you can talk about like, um, what the Arbitrum DAO is and like how it works on a high level. And then we'll pass it over to Daniel to get even deeper, deeper into the weeds. Right. So I think in, in our case, like, you know, or in Arbitrum's case, the, the DAO, um, as we've come to know it, is a collective set of people in the community that are kind of holding a governance token uh, that gives them direct voting power over upgrades to the core protocol, which is a set of smart contracts on Arbitrum 1, on Arbitrum Nova, and on Ethereum L1. Um, Tomorrow is actually the day that, you know, the tokens are actually going to be going into the hands of most users. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, the DAO is really going to come to life. And that's when we expect to see a lot of proposals coming through. So how it works or how, we, you know, um, the community thinks it will work. Obviously, things will change over time is, you know, there's a, a place where a lot of people can discuss changes that they have, uh, ideas that they have. That's the governance forum. Um, there's an official constitution that kind of governs basically everything else that happens after that. Right. So. Um, that you can read in our documentation, but the, the, the kind of high-level summary is people post ideas um, to a forum. Obviously, the idea is that they'll debate, they'll coalesce, they'll form a proposal. Uh, there's a requirement around kind of having a uh, certain number of tokens uh, that a delegate has uh, to be able to put forth a proposal. Uh, there's a, a requirement or a, there's a soft requirement that that goes uh, to an off-chain snapshot, a temperature check, just to make sure that kind of everyone's on board with what it is. And then uh, the formal on-chain proposal can be done with a higher threshold of votes. Um, we likely, you know, expect this to be kind of a delegate sponsoring something that'll go through the system. Uh, there are two types of main proposals that could be raised with different thresholds, like five and three percent, respectively. Uh, one that kind of governs the core protocol, and one that kind of governs, you know, the DAO's treasury. Um, both of those have uh, different, you know, kind of execution windows. How long it takes to get from proposal all the way to execution. Um, that I would say is like the primary kind of governance structure. Then there's also this like separate set of people that have been like now kind of shared with the community, which is the security council. So a group of 12 members, kind of trusted people in the community, highly reputable and, and really intelligent uh, that have the power to, uh, under certain um, circumstances, invoke emergency actions um, should there be kind of a critical vulnerability uh, discovered. So that I would say is like a, a high level description, probably not the most like exciting, but it really is like powerful. Um, at least in my view. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Um, we kind of want DAOs to be exciting, but we also kind of don't right. want them to be exciting. <laughs> yeah. um, right. Like governance drama is fun, but, um, right. you know, and, and sometimes it's good, right? It, it's good when the drama is like everyone legitimately disagrees on a topic and we're going to hash it out in public. That's right. what the DAO is for. It's bad when it's like, oh, no, like something isn't working in the DAO and now we're scared. So boring and, and thorough in, in the design is, is very good in a right. lot of ways. Um, yeah, I would love to hear like Matt, that was kind of a really good overview of like, from the perspective of someone who is potentially participating in governance or like, um, just wants to observe governance, how yeah. it works. Um, Daniel, I'd love to hear a little bit more of your thoughts on like how it works under the hood. Um, I know you, you were involved in building a lot of that. So just like what is actually happening, uh, under the hood in terms of like how the Arbitrum DAO is designed and works. Yeah, for sure. Um, and yeah, I would. It, it's funny. I think I actually said that sentence to you at one point, Matt, when we were talking about the DAO of like, in a weird way, the most important things that it does are the most boring things. Uh, is 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 sort of how I <laughs> yeah. think about it. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, I I like the way um, you framed it generally, which is that the, you know, um, in in practice, we're going to see the Arbitrum DAO do all sorts of things, opening up to a DAO. I mean, you know, it has all sorts of implications, and there's all sorts of, of benefits, all sorts of new complications, but. At its core, like the, at least in my mind, and I think, you know, maybe different people on the team would think about it slightly differently, but in my mind, at its core, it's about, um, you know, these these decisions about how the protocol evolves 
um, meaning the actual on-chain implementation um, of these protocols. So smart contract upgrades being the big thing. There's also other sort of um, important ways you can modify that important, you know, there's like a chain owner that can modify system parameters in important ways. Fundamentally, there's this question of, you know, who gets to make these decisions and who gets to do them. Um, and where one thing that I've sort of, sort of, came around to over the past few years is is essentially there's really no there's really no alternative other than doing something like a DAO. Like maybe it's the best bad alternative, maybe it's the best bad way to do it. But certainly in the big picture, you know, these these sorts of decisions can't just be in the hands of like off chain labs. Um, and it's also certainly true that something as sort of robust and complex as layer two chain um, has to evolve over time. So this is so that's just so like I guess um, and I'll get into some of the technical details in a second, but that's kind of the that's the starting point. That's why we're doing this. And everything else kind of just flows from there is how can we actually decentralize the process of, of making, making upgrades to the chain, let's say um, most generally. So um, I guess um, to, to start, so yeah, I mean, that's maybe the first important distinction is there's all sorts of things that DAO can vote on. The stuff that is, I would say, most important or that we're most interested in are these sort of like on-chain execution stuff, stuff that actually involves, you know, proposals that um, would be effectuated or carried out via smart contracts themselves. There's other stuff the DAO can do, but but this is sort of what we really wanted to have implemented. Um, in terms of what's covered by that, like I said, all of the, you know, upgrading any of the smart contracts. Um, when I saw, you know, I mentioned like uh, certain parameters that can be adjusted, things like the arbitrum gas limit, um, the sort of like inertia of how the gas limit adjusts, there's all sorts of like things like that. Um, that are not literally upgrading a contract, but also like a sort of system admin sort of control. So, um, and a few other related things like that. So all of those effectively belong to the DAO now. Um, in terms of the implementation, so you can, um, what the DAO can do is carry, it can carry out what we call governance actions. Um, and um, essentially, you know, so only the DAO has the, has, has the, has the on-chain affordance to carry out these governance actions. They, the DAO itself can sort of like encode and propose, vote on, and ultimately execute arbitrary execution um, via governance. Um, and, and then again, we just give all the important ownership up, um, um, over to the DAO. Um, in terms of like where a lot, if you look at the contracts, you'll see some, um, you know, the implementation details, um, you'll, see, you'll see sort of additional complexity. And I would say a lot of the additional complexity there comes from this, this idea that for the for the sort of um, critical changes, what we call like the constitutional changes, um, things that really like affect how the system works. We wanted to have this property that any upgrade that takes place before it's executed, users will have a chance to sort of notice, notice that it was approved and take some on-chain action before it actually takes effect. Um, the really the, the important thing we wanna preserve there is in theory, you have a window of time that you can withdraw your funds um, before an upgrade takes place. And the idea here is you can, you know, if the chain's going in a direction you don't like, you can opt out in a more extreme case, which I don't expect, but I think it's just good to sort of have this out. If literally the, the DAO itself gets compromised, the majority of token holders are just like malicious and trying to wreck the chain. Even in that case, we can still preserve this core layer two property, which says that as long as you're kind of paying attention and take some action within some, some amount of time, you can, you can exit. So um, yeah, for the like Solidity developers, you can see some of the fun implementation details are, are sort of enforcing this, enforcing this delay, but maybe I'll, I'll pause there for now. Um, um, yeah, let's, let's leave it at that. Yeah, that's, that's great stuff. Um, I, I actually have a follow-up question, yep. Daniel. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about the, how things are implemented on the layer two and the layer one and like mm. how that relates to Arbitrum's like being a roll up, right. And kind of like the, this, that sort of intersection between like the DAO design and the role design, which, which you started hinting at, right. Like this ability to exit trustlessly to Ethereum, but like talk about the different parts of the DAO that live on, on Arbitrum versus Ethereum L1 and like why they live there and kind of how it works. Yeah. I mean, what's, what's cool is like, you know, we have, we have this full EVM implementation um, that is, you know, that is Arbitrum roll up. We can also sort of use that for core system functionality. Um, so we actually do have, you know, there are important core contracts that live on layer two. Um, some of the token bridge contracts live on layer two. And then, yeah, some of the governance contracts themselves live on layer two. Uh, in fact, I would say the core of it kind of does. So the the intent here is that, you know, Arbitrum 1, which is like our, um, you know, our flagship chain, our, part, our you know, pride and joy, whatever. Um, that's where the need of governance takes place. 
So um, the actual token itself is like native to Arbitrum one. Um, it can be bridged over to other change, but it's it's native to Arbitrum one. Um, I feel like every one of these things I could go off on tangents into. So just let me know if you want me to go um, any deeper into that. But we can just say the token lives on layer two um, on Arbitrum one. That's where proposals and voting and all of that activity takes place. Um, um, but at the same time, there's sort of affordance given um, from this governance system to to the various pieces on other chains, right? So, for example, the core contracts, um, you know, Arbitrum one's a layer two. It settles it settles to Ethereum. The core contracts are essentially still owned by the governance system that resides on Arbitrum one, uh, and that that you know we sort of um, propose vote on Arbitrum one, and then kind of like eventually interact with say a contract on Ethereum via via um, via cross-chain messages. And this is another place where the core protocol itself sort of has arbitrary cross-chain messaging. So you can send a message from layer two to layer one or layer two or layer two or layer one to layer two. I said that right. Um, either direction arbitrarily. We sort of take advantage of that and use our own tool for the governance system, which is which is fun. Similarly with Arbitrum Nova, which is another um, another chain, we have two chains on mainnet. Um, Arbitrum one is our roll-up chain, Arbitrum Nova we call an antitrust chain with sort of a different security model. Governance there is still also controlled by the arbitrum, like at its core, by Arbitrum One. So if a proposal passes that affects Nova, you kind of relay the message around, and it ends up on Nova. Um, so that's that's kind of neat. And then the other cool detail is, you know, I mentioned this delay. The way we actually that this delay, where after a proposal passes, there's some time period before before it's effectuated. I think I'm using the word effectuated right. I should look that up. Um, but um, the way we actually I like enforce it. that. I, I don't care. Right. I don't care whether it's in the dictionary or not. It's perfect. Not a lawyer, but I think it's a word lawyers say for sure. Um, the way the way we actually enforce this delay is we kind of send this what we call a round trip message, which is kind of neat. So it sort of passes on layer two, and the proposal message actually gets sent back down to layer one. And then if say the proposal is uh, affecting a contract on layer two, it'll go back to layer two again. And this sort of enforces that even if there's a dispute, which has to do with how the core rollup protocol works, even if no matter what happens, you're guaranteed to have this this time window to exit. So so yeah, there's there's um, you know, if you're interested in digging into the design, you'll you'll learn stuff about governance in general, but there's also a lot of like layer two and rollup specific stuff built into governance itself, which is uh, which is neat. Yeah, I'll take this opportunity to show the DAO docs that Arbitrum put together. Um, <clears throat> like they describe all of the things that Daniel just mentioned, but also um, they do a really good job of explaining why, like why Arbitrum is a DAO, like what why the DAO exists and how that relates to the roll up side of things. Um, so yeah, if you're if you're looking to learn about roll ups and governance, um, would definitely recommend reading through the Arbitrum DAO docs because they are really great. Um, Thank you. Cool. Well, um, so that was like, that was kind of like a technical thing. Like, I mean, it's funny, like with, with crypto, right? Like you, there's this, like all the, always this like weird intersection between like how things are implemented technically. And then like what we expect people's behavior to be like mm. socially or, or economically, um, which is why it's so fun. Um, but we, I think we've been like more so focused on like the technical side of things here. Um, but I want to touch more on the social side of things and like really where I want to take this is, um, is delegation. So one of the things that we've been, that we've observed um, maybe delegation. And also we can talk a little bit about like the token distribution and logic, um, in what we've observed at, at Tally, like having kind of gone through these like DAO launches and just working closely with a bunch of the, the larger DAOs in the Ethereum ecosystem is like this, this delegation has kind of emerged as like a very, very important tool in the decentralization toolkit. It's like somewhat paradoxical because you would naively think like well no one should delegate their tokens everyone should just like vote with their own tokens you know direct democracy that's like more decentralized but the reality is um this is a problem that's as old as democracy and <laughs> like voter yes. participation is a very very uh very real like uh challenge and so the DAOs that are operating most effectively today in the ethereum ecosystem have a really robust delegation where there are like Many, most of the tokens that exist in circulation are delegated um, and they're sort of like um, a group 
a large group of people who are, um, you know, very interested in the success of the DAO who have voting power delegated to them, but it's a, you know, diverse group, right? That's kind of like the dream that we're looking for. So um, maybe I'll turn it to Matt first and then just like, Daniel, you can just comment um, after Matt's done, but like, would love to hear how Arbitrum is thinking about delegation. Um, Feel free to also touch on like, maybe starting with like, how you're thinking about token distribution, like where the tokens went and why, um, and, and why on some level there, you don't have to go too deep there. Um, but then also how you're thinking about delegation and like what your calls to action would be like, what, where do you, what do you want to see happen from a delegation perspective? Um, you know, uh, uh with the Arbitrum DAO. Sure. So I, you know, I'm definitely not the best person to talk to towards like, you know, allocation and distribution and kind of like how, how that was decided, I think. One thing, though, that uh, just for personal observation and kind of how that was that was done is I think, you know, it was kind of intentional to give the community a large portion of the initial supply to make sure that it was kind of out there, that people could get involved, that, you know, people who had been supporting the protocol for a long time were able to kind of like get a direct stake in kind of the future um, and, and choose what they want to do with that. I think one of the really unique things about about this airdrop in particular and like what the foundation has decided to do is kind of give some of that allocation to DAOs on the networks that are already there. I think, you know, we released that information a couple of days ago and there's like 160 DAOs getting a total of, you know, I can't even remember the total amount, 112 million tokens or something. Um, and what it's been interesting to see that evolve. Some DAOs are already planning to kind of like disseminate that with their users. Some are going to use it directly for voting. So, a complex issue there has come out of just like the distribution itself outside of, you know, eligibility and all the other stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I would say, you know, definitely not the best person on kind of like percentages and shares um, on, on that stuff, but delegation itself, I'm, I would say I have a lot of thoughts on this. It's really interesting. Um, there's kind of a couple of problems that I think you hinted at um, and a couple opportunities that uh, are really interesting to me, at least personally, I think the, the problems are, you know, voter participation, right? Like that's why delegation exists. I mean, you see this in American democracy is really the only system I could comment on, like somewhat intelligent, intelligently, not very much, but you know, you notice that most of the election cycles that happen, you don't see a large portion, not a majority, but a large portion of the population just does not vote. And that is with something that they are seeing advertisements about every day for months um, and they still don't take any action, right? And that's apathy that obviously has been kind of like put on them and maybe, you know, indoctrinated them uh, after, you know, years and years of seeing kind of the same life that they believe. But that's the most powerful advertisement campaign on earth. Still not able to activate most people in, you know, the, the most powerful country. Um, you can imagine now you're on the internet where there's a whole bunch more friction involved because I have to go out and find that information myself, right? There's not these advertisements. There's sometimes there's direct communication. So I think it's going to be a challenge to see, particularly with this DAO, how vote, how voting will play out and how delegates will be at first kind of incentivized, maybe through social, um, you know, noise and social campaigns. And then maybe later on through kind of monetary incentives to actually take action. You know, I, I, I'm personally not, you know, super, um, I guess, bullish on long-term monetary incentivization of voting, um, unless there's like actual responsibility then put on the delegates to do something other than just vote, um, if that makes sense. Like you start to see this becoming more of a political job, uh, it's more similar to a politician and that's where it gets really wonky. Um, I won't go too much into that specific thing. I think that's a huge problem. Lots of people are thinking about it. I know you folks are spending a lot of time on that. So structures to one have more elections more often. Um, I think we're going to be huge. I think there's a big UX problem that can be solved through making sure that elections or any kind of on-chain actions or votes or proposals are being fed to a user in a way that they're able to see it. That's up to the wallets and to the kind of application interfaces, whatever we see kind of happening there. I think we're seeing a lot of consolidation and app store experiences being built, but that message needs to be sent to the users. So there's a huge thing there. One other thing I'll add is I do think that from a DAO perspective and from a delegate perspective and just from voting, there's an interesting kind of issue. And I don't know how it'll be solved, but I have one idea around like fragmentation of uh, interesting voting situations. And what I mean by that is like in a typical election society, you kind of have regional and then federal or, you know, uh, votes based on location, right? Uh, where you are affects kind of what you vote on. Whereas in 
in crypto, as everything kind of starts to continually decentralize, your votes really only exist where you put money uh, and, and, and where you choose to invest, uh, at least as of now. And so what that means is, at least from my view, the Arbitrum DAO is really, really fascinating and the protocol itself is really interesting. But a lot of other interesting votes are going to happen at the application layer. And right now, there's no direct connection between the two. So there's an interesting opportunity for the DAO itself to construct kind of a stake in each of these applications in a way that allows delegates to represent users, not only on behalf of the protocol, but also like within applications themselves. I don't know exactly how that will play out, but it will certainly be a lot easier to deal with voter apathy if you activate them to vote on something that's really important, kind of like all at once and in one interface and with one set of people, as opposed to having to remember delegates across a hundred different applications. Um, so those are two things I find really interesting, but yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Daniel, before you jump in, I have to comment quickly on a couple of things you said there. So, um, you know, you heard it here first, but uh, Tally is helping organize something we're calling Delegation Week in the in the ecosystem. Um, maybe a couple of months out from today, um, and it 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 hits specifically on this re-election problem that you mentioned. Um, if you look at some of the bigger DAOs in the Ethereum ecosystem, like I'll just use ENS as an example. You know, they did their airdrop almost a year and a half ago now um and there is a lot of initial delegation that occurred um but it's been more challenging since then to like re-engage people on delegation right mm -hmm. so there may be delegates who you know aren't even interested in participating in the DAO anymore but they don't necessarily have a way to like even get people to like delegate to someone else right like there's actually a lot of friction around communication there and so um we'll talk more about that once you know arbitrum uh has officially launched the DAO and things have settled down a little bit but um we're hoping to us and a few other folks are hoping to put together sort of like in ecosystem wide week where like every DAO and every DAO tooling company focuses on delegation um, because it will help break down some of that friction if, if like everyone at once is like, hey, if you have tokens, go and look on these platforms, um, you know, and, and, and see what's up with your delegation and make sure it's aligned to the right group. Um, and then uh, the second thing I just wanted to comment on quickly is um, I think there is some really interesting tooling being built in the area of like DAO, <laughs> like uh, DAO governance. How do I put this? It's, it's sort of the last thing you mentioned. Like, let's say there's a DAO treasury that owns a lot of governance tokens. So in the case of Arbitrum, let's say, you know, there's like Treasure DAO, right? They, or, or GMX, you know, they got uh, a, a significant um, you know, airdrop from, from, from the Arbitrum airdrop, like, um, you know, let's say they want to use those tokens to participate directly in governance. Like they're not, you know, you could go there out of giving them to all the users, and then they participate in governance as you described, or maybe you want to have like a big treasury and then you want to somehow like be involved in governments governance with that. It's a little tricky. Cause like with native delegation, right. You have to delegate everything to one address mm. and like, if you want to distribute that voting power up in some way, you basically can't. Um, and so there's like a couple of like really interesting angles on that, that, that we're thinking about internally. One is um, Uniswap built this thing called Franchiser that allows you to like, yeah, delegate the, the tokens to a smart contract, which then uh, allows you to sort of like arbitrary delegate an arbitrary amount of the tokens to different people. But another one is like, <laughs> Meta governance is like an o overused word, but it's sort of like you could imagine, you could imagine the part the voters in a DAO voting about what to vote about in another DAO, right? So you could you could imagine like you know Treasure DAO holding a vote about how Treasure DAO should vote in an Arbitrum vote <laughs> or proposal. Um, and so anyway, those are like I'm really glad you comment on those areas because I think those are also very interesting, like emerging emerging like yeah things that we all need to build towards well i was just i was just gonna say i i'm also really looking forward to um you know observing it observing and participating in, in the arbitrum DAO because i think um yeah there's a few things that i think are like really special about it in terms of like being a learning opportunity for the entire ecosystem um one is it's just like really big you know <laughs> like uh it's it it's probably gonna be the largest DAO by like um treasury size also you know voters like number number of addresses yeah. that have voting power delegated um and uh 
you know, it's, it's probably the most, um, complex isn't the word it's sort of the it has like a lot of power right that the DAO does right because you, you kind of described that it could sort of arbitrarily like call functions on like all these different parts of arbitrum not to mention uh you know distribute funds from this treasury which is probably going to be the biggest one yeah. uh in the in the space and so um i think it's like just incredibly exciting um and i think there will be you know, a lot of interest interest in participating across the ecosystem um and i think you all have done like a really good job this is my opinion. Like, I mean, listen, Tally loves all DAOs. Okay. So just putting that out there, we're equal opportunity lover of all DAOs. All DAOs are good for Tally. Um, but, uh, and we want them all to succeed, but you all have put like a c- incredibly significant amount of thought, just like as, as a DAO nerd, right? Like, um, I'm just like really, really excited by your design and like the whole approach that you're taking, um, across like the social and technical elements. And so I think, you know, um, there will be things that come up obviously that are unexpected that we'll have to address as a, like everyone who participates in the DAO will have to address. But, um, you know, I think, uh, having you kind of, I think did a good job, uh, the DAO has its best foot forward. And so I think there'll be like a lot of opportunities to learn, um, where it's like, okay, we, we sort of like really, uh, try to think of everything. Right. And then there is this one other thing that we didn't think of. Right. So I think it is just like a really good learning opportunity for the ecosystem. I'm super excited by it. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, the, the general kind words and the enthusiasm. Um, and I will, I'll just say, you know, um, um, something weird going on with your video. Uh, you still there? Oh, I am still here. Okay, cool. Just making sure. Oh, it's different. I might, I might, I'm, we might be switching camera views right now permanently yeah. for the rest of this okay. call. Sorry. That works. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> keep, keep going. Yeah. Um, the, I mean, like Matt said earlier, you know, that's just generally been the part of like the off chain labs ethos is like, you know, when we release stuff, it's a real release. It's not like an announcement or an announcement of an announcement. So it was important that we do that for this. And I, I, I think I can honestly say like, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I can't think of many other like either DAO releases or token or, you know, uh, you know, uh, releases of a token airdrops that actually are like feature complete this way on day one. So I'm really proud that we that we did that. Um, and um, yeah, what it means is, as you say, the, you know, it is legitimate. The DAO itself has a lot has a lot of power, which I'm sure will mean that there'll be all sorts of surprises. And maybe this is just an excuse and a segue to talk about just to emphasize something that I think Matt mentioned. but. Um, an important piece to this is I was talking about the very the sort of slow upgrade path and 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 all of that. Um, there is also the Security Council, um, which is um, you know it's a it's a nine of twelve multisig to use these emergency actions. Um, it's distributed um, um, across you know uh, uh, you know so essentially like in the current um, in the current Security Council, there's three members that are on Offchain Labs. The rest are all independent uh, and, re- and requires nine um, to execute. And essentially, any any um, affordance that the DAO has for governance, the Security Council also does, but it can do it quickly. And the idea is, it you know will only use this power. It should only use this power for handling like a time critical emergency. Um, the reason I bring this up, a I want to be clear that that's the case. But um, one really interesting thing, you know, the thinking is let's sort of, you know, as we kick this thing off um, and sort of let it, you know, we give this thing legs and let the community control it let's sort of have everything in place <laughs> that a DAO might need. So there's the sort of like decentralized upgrade path that that's, you know, really slow for critical things. There's decentralized upgrade path for things that don't require an exit, like moving treasury funds. And then there's this sort of like emergency recourse thing that we still have in place. But everything about this um, is itself controlled by the DAO, including the mechanisms of governance themselves. Um, and there's some fun implementation details there to make sure that works, that governance can upgrade itself. But um. Um, so that's really for another one of the really interesting questions, um, for me is, and, you know, there's some tough questions here for the community to decide is, is as, um, how governance itself evolves, inc- including the role of the security council and how this will become sort of trust minimized over time. Um, what we're already going to do is there'll be sort of, um, biannual elections of the security council members, which itself is also going to be interesting because it's sort of a, um, it's like an automatic, uh, um, that's like an automatic beat where everyone, you know, at, at this date, if you're a delegate, you'll sort of be expected to participate. But that gives us some nice recourse on the on the Security Council. But yeah, we're already thinking of other ideas of like what's the next step for decentralizing that. And um, um, yeah, so so 
um, all of those decisions are are part of governance and and are part of what the DAO does as well. So that's sort of um, once we get past you know tomorrow when the token drop actually happens, um, that'll kind of be the I would say the primary thing uh, that I'll be thinking about in terms of just where my head's at of of, of what comes next. Yeah. yeah, that's the governance controls the governance. That's extremely based. Um, like really, it is. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, all yeah, right, cool. Well, um, thanks for, thanks for kind of going down that rabbit hole with me. Um, hopefully folks listening, you know, can tell that there's a lot of really exciting stuff happening in the Arbitrum DAO and we'll, we'll engage, uh, once the DAO is live. So if it's cool with you guys, I want to transition to some fun closing questions. Um, the first one is a two part question. So it's what's your favorite part about working in crypto and then your least favorite part or just like something that you think we need to work on, you know, as, as an industry. Um, so I'll start who you guys can choose who's whoever's ready can start. Matt, you okay, go first. Got a okay, sure. Um, <laughs> so I, I've got, I've got two answers to this question because only because like one is the truth and one is just something I think is really, really interesting. Um, the truth is that, you know, Everyone is motivated by the same thing, um, at least when you're at a job. Everyone is at a job to make money. But at all the jobs I've been in, um, outside from ones where I'm surrounded by like pre-existingly wealthy people, um, people are here. People here in crypto are slightly more motivated or a lot more motivated to work and to come to work and to change things and to solve hard problems because of the benefit that the work provides for other people. Um, and the utility that we're creating. And it, it, so it's, that's just like the most fascinating thing. I'm also like spoiled because off chain labs is just like that special of a place to work. It's I'm sure it's, it can't be like that everywhere. Otherwise there'd be many, many arbitrums. Um, the, so that's my favorite thing. I say that though, one other thing I think is just really, really interesting is I came, as I mentioned from traditional web two, very bureaucratic, very large organization. Like I started, there was like 60,000 people. When I left, it was like 200,000. Um, what's really interesting is that crypto functions almost identically to an alphabet or an Amazon or an Apple. It's just that all of the departments and all of the teams are just little companies. Everyone's still motivated by the same goal, um, more or less, but you still have like, you know, the leaders of each team and the political things and the different kind of like selfish desires that each group has. But when we unite and when we come together, when we need to work together, it's, it's almost seamless as long as you share that motivation. So that's been an interesting observation um, from my end. Um, yeah, I would say for me, I mean, what's, what's, what's always been the most fun for me about the space is there, you know, I think this is true, you know, anyone who's working in this space, you're sort of always on the edge of new, um, like new research topics, new technical challenges. Um, and that's, that's really fun, you know, that you, you sort of like solving new problems and like encountering new types of problems <laughs> where there's literally no, yeah. there's no playbook. And, and, um, yeah, that just, it makes it constantly, um, intellectually engaging and interesting. Um, so it's, yeah. uh. Um, never boring for that reason. Um, you know, I would say, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. I was thinking the whole time about how best to phrase this. But um, in terms of where, let's say where the space could do better, I, it's, it's on the, like on the one hand, you know, when I think about how much the space has grown since I've been following it, it's, it's mind blowing. And I actually didn't, in some ways, I didn't think it would grow this fast. I also think that, you know, if you had just told me, if we had gone back some years, to like let's say 2016 and you just gave me like the numbers of you know how many people are working in the industry how big the market cap is and all, all these things like that from that i would have assumed that there would be sort of more of what i think of as the most interesting use cases proliferating in other words yeah. you know there's there are great projects and there are sort of good and important things being done with crypto but a lot of the stuff say at the application level is still you know either more on the silly end of things you know um even, you know, uh, unfortunately, there's still, you know, a fair amount of, uh, a fair amount of scams, things like that. Um, and, and I guess just like improving that ratio is still something that I would, that I would like to see. Um, yeah. And it's kind of, you know, I tend to be focused on like the protocol level stuff, not the application level stuff. But increasingly, I'm like, yeah, I just want to see uh, more of the more of the types of things that got me interested in this tech to begin with. I'd like to see those those grow more. Um, here, here, here. Awesome. Um, okay. Last question, um, not crypto related, but could, can nah. be if you want it to be. Uh, <laughs> you know, maybe maybe Daniel's <laughs> answer is crypto Twitter. Uh, what is your favorite place in the world and why? <laughs> favorite 
favorite place in the world? Uh, that's easy for me. I'll go. I'm, I'm from a, a small town on the big island of Hawaii, and that's like the best place on earth. I've been to a lot of places, and I think that the family values and the connection and the community and the, the kind of alignment. <laughs> people people there would just be like, what the, what, what the hell are you talking about if I said alignment? But it's the best. Um, it's honestly like why I'm in this industry, you know. We're, we all have our, our, each other's backs there, and you know, so much is about kind of the benefit of every person. Um, and so, you know, I, the reason why I joined crypto is because I wanted to productionize that. <laughs> and so, we need protocols to do that. Okay. So, yeah. great, nice. great answer. I I live in Utah, and I prior to working at Tally, I worked for, in like a Utah based Web two company, and there's a lot of um, Hawaiians who have like mm. moved here. Um, but they still have all their family back in Hawaii and like, yeah. they all speak of it in with similar reverence, uh, <laughs> you, you know, for, for yeah. similar reasons. So, um, anyway, that's a great answer. Favorite place on earth, not crypto Twitter. Uh, let's just rule that out. <laughs> um, I'll go with an actual place. Um, I've, um, actually, you know, I like the outdoors. Uh, I'll go with somewhere nature, but North Carolina is a place, uh, various parts of it that, you know, I, I feel affinity for. Um, Asheville, I'll give a shout out to Hendersonville. Um, yeah, uh, despite despite I being on crypto Twitter all the time, I do like the outdoors and nature. So I, uh, um, yeah, sometimes I think about um, about spending more time in North Carolina and less time on the computer. But also a great alas. answer. I am quite familiar with Hendersonville. Um, have oh, spent yeah. a lot of time there. My, <clears throat> I'm from Chapel Hill originally, and uh, my wife's family lives in South Asheville in Hendersonville. So. Um, okay. on the same page <laughs> great great place great place great. Right. um cool all right well um i think that's about it so unless there's any other like fire takes you want to get off um in the next two minutes i think we'll we'll wrap up here um thanks so much for joining daniel and matt